Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Experimental Cataclysm. If you're new here, this is a series where I talk about the recent additions to the experimental version of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. And of course, we'll be talking about those changes that have been made through Monday the 20th of September. Well, first up today, we've got an update on something that we talked about in the last show. We had talked about the addition of practice recipes to the game, which seemed to be one of the best ways to improve your skills. Now, the main drawback was that, well, it only existed for two skills. But over the last couple of weeks, we've seen an expansion of this. Now, there were several added, and I will link to the PRs that I saw in the description down below. Also, this was a collective effort. A few different people made these changes. It was not one specific individual. Not much to say about this. I have already expressed that I think the practice system is one of the best changes we've seen in the last few months, and I stand by that description. As they continue to expand to more skills and proficiencies, I think we're going to see players leaning very heavily on this new system as we progress in the game. So good work to everyone who was involved in this expansion. I really do think this is very great. Now next up we have a relatively simple change surrounding refitting clothing. Previously, when you wanted to refit a garment of clothing, you would do so by activating a sewing tool and then using the same menu that you would for repairing it. In fact, you would have to repair or reinforce it and have the appropriate skill levels in order to make refitting happen, or even have the option appear in this menu. Now, of course, that was not very obvious, especially for new players, since it was in fact completely hidden unless you had those appropriate skills. Now, thanks to Disejuin, uh, sorry, refitting has its own option in this menu. Now this is an improvement in the UI because as I said previously it was not immediately obvious that you could even do this unless you had the skills. Now I was going to complain about how much skill is required to resize a lot of garments and how I'm really not a fan of our refitting system but ultimately I don't think that has much bearing on this particular PR. This is a good change, it makes refitting more visible and I think that overall that is a very good thing. Next up from Frozen Tier CDDA we have a new mutation tree. Now this change adds several rabbit mutations to the game and it gets its own category so that means you'll be able to find and make rabbit mutagen and serums. Now, I can't remember the last time we had a major addition like this for mutations, it's pretty neat. Well in fact, I mean we talk all the time on Discord about adding new mutation categories and trees but mostly what people suggest are pretty bad. Yes, everyone has ideas for new animal trees but the reality is that most of the time they fit into existing groups. For instance, I've previously joked about making a unicorn tree, but the reality is that a horse or a unicorn tree would have so much overlap with like a uh, with the bovine tree or cattle tree that it would just be sort of redundant. However, I think that bunny actually is different enough to stand on its own. In addition to the changes that are explicitly rabbit, such as rabbit ears or rabbit feet, the other features of being Okay, so I looked up the animal adjective for rabbits and Google says it's leperine, but I've never heard that before, so I'm just gonna skip this part. Anyway, the features of being rabbit-like are sufficiently different from other existing animal categories, and so I think it ha that having a completely new tree centered around bunnies is great. And as I said, I've been around for kind of a long time, and I really can't remember the last time we got a whole new tree like this. Now, like all the other trees in the game, this one contains a wide variety of mutations. Now, there are several explicitly bunny things, like we mentioned, rabbit ears and rabbit feet, in addition to many of the traits that you've already seen in the game. Now, I tried looking exactly what all mutations this tree gets so that I could provide you with an overview, but I actually don't understand how mutations work in the game, and I could not find an actual list of rabbit mutations. As such, here I'm just going to show a screenshot from this PR. Now this shows a list of a heavily mutated rabbit person to kind of give you an idea of what they get. And of course you can apply common sense to these things. For instance, rabbits are herbivores, so it makes sense that that would show up in their mutation tree. Anyway, major props for adding this to the game, and they were a first time contributor as well. So good job! Next up from Cork, we have the ability to choose a separate tile set for the map screen. Now we did talk a while back about the new feature that enabled your map screen to use a tile set rather than ASCII characters. The feature itself is very nice and if you have not checked it out, it's in a much better state now than when it launched. Now the change that we're talking about today actually adds an option in the graphics menu line 32 that lets you select a tile set for use on the map screen. This means that you can use one tile set for the main game and then select a completely different tile set exclusively for the map. Now I like Altica, in fact I like Altica quite a lot, but I still think that the Retro Days map looks the best. 
And that's just my opinion, and God knows my tastes change all the time, but yeah, this means I can use Altica for my game and then use the Retro Days map if that's what I want to do. It's quite a nice little feature and I wanted to shout it out. However, there is something here that I have an issue with. Korg commented on this PR, and unless I'm misunderstanding him, he wants to remove the option entirely for using the old ASCII map. Now, I understand that they want the map to be graphical, and I understand that you and possibly other people worked very hard on making all of this happen, updating tile sets, all the stuff that has gone into this. But there is no cause, at least from my perspective, to remove the option of using the old map. Now I'm sure someone is going to leave me a comment or Korg will comment telling me that this is necessary and that I just don't know what I'm talking about. But really, I, I strongly, strongly dislike when things like this are removed when there's no obvious reason for it. Now I assume locations in the game are still going to receive ASCII symbols and whatnot in the JSON, so what is the harm in leaving it around? Uh, the code for this cannot possibly be that much of a bloat for the overall game files. Anyway, working on the idea that they're going to remove it and boohoo for me, nothing can be done about it, I decided to try out the uh, ASCII tile set on the map screen. I mean, it's not terrible, but it definitely does not look the same as the old map, but it is possible that in the future this is going to be your only option for those of you that would prefer that style. Again, I strongly dislike that they're planning to remove the old map, I don't understand why that's necessary at all, and it just feels sort of like you're forcing that on us for no good reason. Uh, but anyway, then additionally, there were some issues here along the way with this new feature. I found that changing tile sets for the map screen does not properly update. So if you change tile sets, it will not immediately update your map screen. Uh, there was an issue for this, but it was then fixed. But then when I tried it again today, it still doesn't work. So I, I don't really know what to make of that. If you change your tile set as of the time uh, that I'm recording this, you will actually need to back out of the game and reload the save in order to get your map screen to change to your newly selected tile set. Uh, but anyway, that's enough about that. I think having an independent tile set for the map screen is a really nice little feature and I definitely will be using it moving forward. And I know for everyone who's listening to this, I know it's an adjustment to go from the old map to the tiles map, but I would really encourage everyone listening to this to give it another shot. So I would encourage you to check it out. Now next up from L Tank, we have a change to book entries. This is a nice little change around the display for recipes and practice. So first off, I had complained in the last show about how practice recipes were not displayed on a book's entry. Now this has been changed. Once you have at least skimmed a book, you can open the book's item entry to get a look at recipes and all that, all that jazz. There's a section that says this book can help you practice, and then it will list practice recipes contained in that book. So that on its own is a great change. I'm glad we'll be able to see what practice is available to us at a glance from the book menu. Now this change also improved the display for general recipes as well. Previously, recipes in a book were all just sort of smashed together in one huge list. Now, the recipes will be broken down into categories. The book will display recipes that you have already memorized in the quote, you already know how to craft section of the entry. Then the recipes that you have the skill requirement to craft, as long as you have the book nearby, will be listed as you understand how to craft. And then finally, recipes in the book that you would be able to craft if you had better skills, they will be listed as you lack the skills to understand. Now previously we would often see people ask questions about book recipes and one of the most common ones that I saw would be someone coming in and saying, hey I'm looking at the recipe list, what does it mean if it's brown in the book entry? And now we have a clear UI that conveys that the brown color coding represents the lack of skills to understand that recipe, at least from that particular book. Anyway, hopefully that all makes sense. This really is a very nice quality of life change and I do think that this is going to help new players. If nothing else, it is a solid improvement over the way things used to look and is a pretty good change overall. So good work on that. Next up, we have a quick change. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it because it is currently only available through the debug menu. But anyway, once again from L Tank, which by the way, hello L Tank, you're doing quite a lot lately and most of the changes that I've been covering from you have been quite good. You just sort of came out of nowhere, but you seem to be a real asset to the project. So um, yeah, just keep up the good work. But anyway, from Al Tank, we've got the debug ability to take control of and continue playing as an NPC follower. Now, a lot of this PR here will talk about the technical side of this change and the testing of the feature, but I have a smooth brain, so some of that is beyond me. I will, of course, link to this in the description down below, and I would encourage you to go read it if that interests you. Now, this is only available through the debug menu and is not 
not available without cheating. I don't usually talk about debug stuff, but people have talked for basically, I mean, as long as I can remember, about wanting to swap to an NPC follower. If development for this continues, the natural progression would probably lead to players being able to do this through normal play. And I thought people would want to hear about this possibility. So essentially what this does is allow you to remove control from your player character and transfer that to an NPC follower. This would allow you to play the NPC as though it were your main character and you would be able to just play the game as you normally would. Now I don't know if I like the idea of transitioning your playthrough from one character to the next. I'm definitely more of a you die game over kind of guy. But again, based on my years of being in the community and listening to people talk, I figured people would want to know about this. Anyway, so yeah, not much to say right now, only available through the debug menu, but it is something I'm going to keep an eye on because I think it would interest people a lot if this became a vanilla feature of the game. And then finally today we have the addition of enemy weak points from I am Urk. Now this is another thing that people have talked about off and on for a few years now and it's neat to see it finally come to the game. Now the gist of this PR is that many enemies have now been assigned weak points. Now I want to be clear, this is not representative of you hitting a specific organ or anything that you would traditionally think of as a critical hit. This instead represents a weak point in the sense that there will be less armor coverage on that body part. For example, if I'm fighting a heavily armored creature and I shoot them in the eye, well, spoiler alert, most creatures don't have any armor that cover their eyeballs. So this is a weak point, not because I'm hitting their eye and blinding them or anything, like a critical hit, but it's because there's very little armor covering that body part. And I think that's a very important distinction to make, otherwise this just seems like it would be a critical hit. It is not, that is not how this works. So how does it work, I hear you ask. Okay, so hopefully I understand this right, don't hate me if I'm wrong, but basically many enemies in the game have now been assigned weak points. Now this has not been applied to every single creature, and it seems likely that in the future there will be additional PRs that add new weak points or rework existing weak weak points, etc, etc. When you attack a creature, you do not control if you attack a weak point or not. It is a random chance and the main thing that you as a player can control would be the skill in that weapon category and your marksman slash melee skill depending on which weapon you're using. So it is random and the thing that influences it the most seems to be your skill levels. Now when you hit a weak point, you will get a special message in a log explaining that you hit one of these less armored body parts. Now this is the main appeal of this change for me personally, adding some flavor to combat by having these special messages. Now after you've landed the blow, there is some math that goes on behind the scenes and that is ultimately what determines how much damage you've dealt. So these weak points have an armor multiplier and armor offset and coverage. Now basically coverage works like our armor in the game, it is the chance that that particular weak point will be hit. Now smaller weak points are obviously less likely to be hit by an attack. Once you've hit the weak point, the armor of the creature is reduced by the armor multiplier, which differs depending on the armor type, and it will also be different for different weak points. Now after that multiplier reduces the armor value, armor offset further reduces it by a flat amount. Now this gives the final armor value, which is then what will be used to figure out how much damage gets through. Do you need to know all of those things? Well, no, but I looked into it and I thought it was neat, so why wouldn't I explain it? Now at the end of the day, all you need to know as the player is that hitting a weak point will mean you will in most circumstances deal more damage. It will depend primarily on the weapon that you're using and the enemy you're fighting since different damage types are factored differently. But in general, hitting a weak point is a good thing and it will mean more damage. Now the only way you can really improve your chances of hitting a weak point is to raise the skills connected to the weapon that you're using and the overall combat skill that governs that type. In other words, marksman or melee skills. Now this PR is the initial implementation of weak points. This is the first time that they will be visible to the player. Player. And I do want to say that this is working on the foundations of something that was added a few weeks ago by Joshua Chin. And because this is the first time that we're seeing these, it's likely that they will be expanded and refined in the future. Now although they added weak points to many zombies, they were sort of quickly added in bulk. In the future, some of these creatures will have their weak points changed or refined or some will be removed. And of course, other enemies in the game will also probably get weak points over time. Anyway, in summation, I think these are really great changes, but I also think this is just the beginning and that we're going to see a lot more of these PRs in the future. With that though, I think we're about ready to wrap the episode. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. Uh, feel free to click that subscribe or like button on your way out if you're so inclined. And I, of course, I'll be back in a couple weeks with another episode, so I'll see you next time.